it's a big pleasure for me to introduce Professor Paulo Teixeira. I think you don't know about this. Um, Paulo Teixeira was one of the persons behind the scenes of this program. Um, for many times, Ricardo uh, asked him about people that we could invite to this program, people that should give you uh, good lectures uh, in this program. So he's one of the responsibles for uh, this program to be a success. Um, so let's, part, uh, let's go now to, to the formal part of my introduction. So Professor Paulo Teixeira is a biologist by training uh, with a bachelor degree from Universidade Estadual de Campinas and he has a PhD degree in genetics and molecular sciences from the same university. After that, he was a postdoctoral fellow at the University of North Car Carolina uh, and a researcher at the Howard Hughes Medical Institute, both in the U.S. Currently, Paulo is, is an assistant professor at the Universidade de São Paulo in the Escola Superior uh, de Agricultura Luiz de Queiroz. We call ESAUC, that is the campus uh, of the University of São Paulo in the city of Piracicaba. In Paulo's lab, they study the immune system of plants and the strategies the microorganisms or the pathogens uh, use to manipulate it. To make it, they use a variety of molecular techniques, genetics uh, manipulations such as CRISPR-Cas, and comparative genomics. So please help me to welcome Professor Paulo Teixeira. Hey, thank you very much, Fabian. Uh, thanks for the invitation. You know I'm a huge fan of this program, so it's a, it's a pleasure to be here today sharing a little bit of my, my work with you guys. So, um, as Fabian said, uh, I'm a professor at the University of Sao Paulo. Specifically, I'm at the School of Agriculture, which is located in Piracicaba. And my lab studies the plant immune system. But more than that, we are very interested in understanding how microbes interfere with it to cause, uh, to establish a successful colonization. And when we think about, you know, plants microbe interactions, we normally think of diseases, right? Plants pathogens. Uh, but it turns out that plants interact with a wide diversity of microbes, and most of these microbes are not pathogens. So uh, today I'm going to share a little bit of our work related to how the microbiome, this community of microbes, interacts with the plant's immune system. And I would like to start with this image here. This is a figure that I show in the very first class of my, uh, the very first lecture of my class on, on plants microbe interactions. And I ask the students to tell me what they see here. And they will normally say, we see a forest. And then I push them a little bit and I ask, okay, what kind of organisms are there? And they say, plants, trees. And then I have to push them a little more uh, and ask what you know is there, but you don't necessarily see in this figure. And then the students will start saying things like animals. Normally animals are the first ones. They will mention insects, uh, sometimes monkeys, birds, fish. And then I have to push more and more so that they remember they are in a plant microbe interaction course. And then they start talking about microbes. And then, okay, there is bacteria and there is fungi. And of course, we know that microbes are in every uh, environment, in every ecosystem. And they are actually very important for uh, these, these, these uh, uh, ecosystems. They can be living in the soil, for instance. Uh, they can be free living organisms. Or they can be living in associ association with other uh, um, uh, organisms. They can be inside animals or they can colonize plants. And as I said, they are very important for, you know, the, the balance, the ecological balance in the systems, and they're very important for animal and plant health and development. But of course, there are some microbes that cause disease. They try to take advantage of, for instance, plants, and they will just cause lesions, absorb nutrients, and eventually cause disease that sometimes even kill the host. And this is particularly important when we talk about, you know, artificial environments 
in agriculture. Right? Of course, plants get infected in natural environments, but this is pretty important for us when disease happens in, in a field. For instance, here we have a potato uh, field and this uh, uh, plantation here is infected with a pathogen known as Phytophthora infestans. This is a pretty devastating pathogen. Uh, this name, Phytophthora, literally means the plant killer, okay? And this can kill this entire field here within two weeks. So you can see here, uh, in two weeks, this field's gone. And this disease is known as late blight. It's a, it's a big problem. And it's actually pretty famous because that's what caused the Great Famine in Ireland. So in the middle of the 19th century, uh, we had a huge epidemic of this disease in Ireland. And uh, they basically didn't produce enough food, didn't produce enough potato. And so they had a lot of starvation and a lot of uh, problems to, to sustain the population at that time. So many people died or they migrated to other countries. So this, this map here on the right side is just showing the population fall with different areas of Ireland during this period. So the more red in this figure, the higher the population fall. And this was so important for their history that they even have a memorial here in Dublin to kind of remember and acknowledge what happened. So this is just one example of how plant disease can change the course of our civilization, you know, of, of our history. And uh, plant diseases are really important. They are among the most important problems that we have in agriculture. Every year we lose about 20, 30% of our agriculture production because of pathogens and pests. And more than that, we spend a lot of money, a lot of resource to try to control these, these uh, diseases. It's estimated that we spend about $30 billion in agrochemicals every year to control uh, diseases. And of course, when we don't use agrochem agrochemicals uh, correctly, they can be bad for the environment. So it's just a, a number of problems that can be associated with diseases. And um, every single plant that we grow in agriculture has an important pathogen, at least one important pathogen. Now, I'm telling you that many microbes infect plants and cause disease. But plants are much more than mere substrates for, for microbes. They actually fight back. They have an immune system that evolved to perceive potential invaders and resist and block their development, right? Uh, and to be honest, this immune system works most of the time. So plants are resistant to most of the microbes that may attempt to colonize them. But of course, sometimes we do see an infection. Plants do get sick, right? So the question is, why? What happens when this, this uh, successful colonization is achieved? And um, this image here represents, uh, is just a, a microscopy of a leaf. And this leaf is uh, uh, infected with a pathogen known as yellow peronospora rhodopsidis. Each um, um, ball here, each circle, if you will, is a plant cell. And this darker filament here is the pathogen hyphen, right? So you can see that it's growing among the plant cells, in between the cells. And this, the plant cells that are in, in, in touch with the pathogens have these darker uh, circles here. So I can highlight this here. This is a plant cell. And this darker structure is actually a structure that the pathogen produces. It's called haustorium. And it's basically a feeding structure. This is used for the pathogen to absorb nutrients. But more than that, the pathogen uses this structure to secrete molecules inside the plant cell. Okay, so it's secreting these molecules that we call just effectors. These are normally proteins that can manipulate the plant immune system and the plant metabolism. So why do plants get sick? Why do the immune system fail? 
because the pathogens can interfere with it. They can suppress the plant's defense response and they can uh, interfere with the host metabolism. And bacteria also use this. I'll go back one slide. This, this system here is very common for what we call filamentous pathogens, meaning fungus and oomycetes. But bacteria can also use these effector molecules. So what I'm, what I'm showing here on the left side is a cartoon of a plant cell. And here we have a bacterium. And this bacterium is using what we call a type three secretion system. This is literally a, a molecular syringe that the microbe use to inject effectors inside the plant cell. So these are virulence factors that will then shut down the plant uh, immune system and uh, manipulate the metabolism. Uh, this syringe here is pretty complex. It's actually a very beautiful structure, as you can see here in this cartoon on the right side. This is just bridging the, the bacterial cell and the host cell. So this is kind of a, it's a syringe, right? That the bacteria use to inject its virulence factors inside the plant. Okay, so we know all this because we have been studying plant microbe interactions for about 30 years. So this field that we, we call the, the molecular plant microbe interaction was born in the 90s, early in the 90s. And uh, it basically started with the cloning of the first A virulence gene in a pathogen. So when I say A virulence gene, I mean, it's a gene that a pathogen has or can have. And when the pathogen has this gene, it cannot infect the plant. So it basically confers A virulence. Uh, and we now know that this gene encodes some factor like a protein that is recognized by plant immune receptors. So we, we actually, a few years later, we cloned the first immune receptors in plants. And then we found that, okay, plants have these, uh, these sensors to perceive pathogen molecules and then activate a defense response. So since then, we have been studying the molecular basis of plant microbe interactions, right? So it has been about 30 years. We have learned a lot of how this works. But we have been mostly studying the plant immune system, thinking about disease, right? Thinking about pathogens. Of course, because we want to solve problems like this one. Like tomato is a, a, a very important crop for us. Everything that affects tomato is bad. So we want to find solutions to, to problems like this. Or even this, this is a, a soybean field and it's infected with a disease called soybean rust. Brazil is the largest producer of soybean in the world, but we spend about $3 billion in fungicides every year just to control uh, uh, this particular problem here. So of course we wanna know how plants and microbes interact so that we can find solutions for, for things like this. And actually pretty much any, any culture that we have uh, will have an important pathogen that we have been studying over the past years. And then it turns out that plants have an immune system, right? We learned that plants have actually a quite complicated immune system. It's an innate immune system. And we normally say that plants have two layers of receptors. The first layer is shown here in this image. The first layer of receptors is right here in the, uh, in the cell membrane. So this is a cell, a plant cell. And here we have a, um, a receptor that has this extracellular portion that perceives molecules that are outside the plant cell. And the molecules that are normally perceived are called MAMPs or micro, micro associated molecular patterns. These are molecules that are found in microbes uh, and are perceived by plants. So you have here, for instance, this bacteria that is infecting the plant, and it will have some, some molecules that are perceived by these receptors. And once this receptor is activated, we're gonna have an intracellular signal, and this will activate a number of biochemical responses, which we call uh, MTI or MAMP-triggered immunity. So for sure, the most well-known MAMP that we, we have is the bacterium flagellum. So bacterial cells, many of them, 
of them will have this flagellum here, which are used for you know locomotion. They can swim in their environment. And this is made of proteins. And there is a specific region in this protein, which is a 22 amino acid uh, peptide. We call this flag 22. And this small peptide is sufficient to activate the immune response in most plants. So most plants will have a receptor that detects this peptide, and then this leads to the, to the activation of the immune response. Now, there are many other uh, examples of MAMS. I can highlight some here, like the uh, peptidoglycan, which is part of the bacterial cell wall, or this protein known as elongation factor EFTU. It's a highly conserved protein in bacteria, so plants learned or evolved strategies to perceive this, this protein here. Or chitin. Chitin is a sugar. It's the same sugar that makes the, the exoskeleton of insects, and it's a sugar that is found in the cell wall of fungi. And ergosterol. Ergosterol is a lipid. It's very similar to our cholesterol, but it's specific to fungi. So basically, plants can perceive microbial molecules, right? That's why they are called microbe-associated molecular patterns. So these are molecules that are normally absent in the plant, and when they are there, the plants say, okay, there's something wrong. Uh, I shouldn't be detecting these molecules. There must be an invader. That's pretty much what happens. And as I said, this first immune response here is sufficient to halt the development of most uh, invaders. But you know, pathogens are adapted by definition. So they evolve the strategies to actually counterattack the plant. So as I told you, they can use these effector molecules here that in this case is, are being injected by the pathogen and they will just suppress this immune response. They will make the plant susceptible. And when this happens, we say that we have an ETS event or effector triggered susceptibility. So this is a fight, right? Sometimes the plant wins, sometimes the pathogen wins. In this case, the pathogen is winning. But plants can fight back. They can have a second layer of immune receptors, and these immune receptors are now here inside the cells. These are a family of receptors known as NLRs, and they can perceive the presence of these effectors. And when this happens, we're gonna basically restore the immune signaling, and then we have the uh, again the immune response. And in this case, it's known as ETI or effector triggered immunity. When this happens, we normally have a very strong response. Sometimes the cell even kills itself so that it does not allow the pathogen to, to spread. Okay. This is all cool, and as I said, this was established most, mostly by the study of plant pathogens. But it turns out that most microbes that plants interact with are not pathogenic. Actually, the pathogens are, are the exception, right? Plants are constantly interacting with a wide diversity of microbes, hundreds, thousands of species that colonize their roots, their leaves, their flowers, fruits, every single tissue, right? So they form these, these communities uh, that we call uh, microbiomes. And this can be analogous to what we have in animals, right? Uh, maybe many of you heard about the, the human microbiome. The human microbiome is essentially the collection of microbes that live in, in the human body, right? We have our, our microbes in our skin, in our, uh, uh, our guts, for instance. And uh, it's now well established that they are not just passengers, but they are actually important for you know, our health, to our immune system, for the prevention of disease, and help us to obtain uh, 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 nutrients and so on. So that's pretty much what happens in plants. Um, in the last, let's say, 10 years, we have been focusing a lot on these microbes. As I said, we have ignored the microbiome for a long time, uh, but people are paying more and more attention to, to these communities that live in, in plants. 
So as I said, most of the microbes that colonize plants are not pathogens, and they can sometimes even help the plants. They can be beneficial. So many microbes can help the plants grow. They can produce hormones that simulate plant growth. They can help plants to acquire nutrients, right? So they can help with nitrogen fixation, with phosphorus acquisition. They can even help plants to resist stresses, such as drought or even biotic stresses, like they can extend the plant immune system and help plants to fight off disease. Now, what is, what is interesting in, in our field is that, okay, we know that plants have an immune system and it's an immune system that evolved to perceive microbial molecules, right? But at the same time, they, they are home to a, a large collection of microbes. So how is it possible? How can the plant immune system prevent pathogens, but at the same time allow beneficial microbes, commensal microbes, right? Can plants differentiate good and bad microbes? So these are some important questions that we have in our field uh, at the moment. And um, a while ago I did uh, an analysis with some colleagues and we basically took uh, more or less 600 uh, bacteria that were isolated from Arabidopsis. This is a, a model plant. And uh, these were pretty much, you know, bacteria that were found in the Arabidopsis microbiome. And we searched in their genomes for well-known MAMPs, you know, for well-known MAMPs. And to our surprise, at least 608 of these 627 bacteria, or 97%, had the potential to encode an immunogenic man. In other words, 97% of these bacteria are likely recognized by the plant immune system. Okay, so they carry molecules that plants evolved to perceive and activate a defense response uh, against pathogens, right? So, um, how can this be possible, right? How is this possible? How does the plant immune system differentiate patterns from the, the community of microbes that live uh, with them? So as I said, this is a very important question that we have in our field. And what I'm gonna show you next is a set of experiments that we did to try to understand this a little more. So we basically used what we call a synthetic community. This is a community of bacteria that were put together, and these uh, bacteria were isolated from uh, mostly Arabidopsis roots. And we asked if this community could be uh, could interfere with the plant immune response under control conditions. So when I talk about this synthetic community or syncom, I'm third. I'm talking about this uh, community, this collection of 35 bacteria that were put together basically as an attempt to mirror, to mimic the taxonomic distribution that we normally find inside the plant roots. So each color here in this figure is a different uh, taxonomic group of bacteria. So we have this proportion of uh, proteobacteria, this other proportion of firmicutes, this proportion of actinobacteria. This is what normally uh, happens inside the roots. And if you look here, we have the taxonomic distribution in the soil. So it's quite different, right? Soil and uh, uh, plant roots. Uh, so this tells us that what lives inside the roots is not a mere uh, representation of what's available in the, the soil. There must be some sort of selection of the microbes that can colonize the plants. So our synthetic community here just tries to mimic this taxonomic distribution in terms of uh, proportion. So in some way they were selected in a, in a random manner. So what we did, did we do here? First, we had plants growing without any bacteria, okay? And we also had plants growing with this syncone uh, that, so we just boiled the bacteria before uh, giving to the plants. And we also had plants growing with the syncone alive. And for each of these treatments, 
plants were treated or not with flag 22 so just remember flag 22 is an easier of plant immune responses right so this actually activates uh, the plant immune system that's the piece of the bacterial flagellum it's a man so we we evaluated the plant immune response just after one or 12 days and of course we did this experiments three independent times and each time I had three uh, replicates per condition for a total of nine biological replicates per condition here. And these are the conditions of the experiment. So we had plants growing, as I said, without bacteria, but then with and without flag 22. Plants growing with the dead syncom, and again, with and without flag 22. And plants growing with the syncom alive and with and without flag 22. And then for each of these treatments, we basically evaluated the development of the, the root, and we also uh, harvest tissues to evaluate the plant transcriptome, right? So we use a technique known as uh, RNA-seq, and through bioinformatics, we evaluated the gene expression, uh, uh, the expression of all genes in the plant. So what I'm showing here first is just uh, the measurements of the root lamp uh, in these different treatments. First thing I want to tell you is that when plants are exposed to a lamp, to an elicitor, they grow less, okay? So you can see this here. This is our control condition, no bacteria, and with and without flag 22. What we are measuring here is root lamp. So uh, the roots are much longer in the absence of the elicitor in comparison to the uh, presence of the elicitor. This is shown here in this representative image. So you can see here that plants treated with flag 22 have shorter roots. And this actually reflects something that is, is quite well known, which is the growth defense trade-off. There is a balance. So plants need to decide to allocate their energy based on growth or defense, right? So when they, they have their immune system activated, they grow less. So it's a, a cellular decision that is made here. We see pretty much the same thing here, right? In this control, which is plants growing with the dead bacteria. So without flag 22, the roots are long. With flag 22, the, the roots are, are shorter. So this is shown here as well. But then we have something different when the syncone is present alive, when this, this representative microbiome is present. So the roots are shorter, even in the absence of flag 22. So at least in terms of root development, this community somehow mimics the effect that the elicitor has uh, on the plant. But of course, what we wanna know is how the immune system behaves in this case. How is the expression of the defense-related genes in these plants? So as I said, we use a technique known as RNA-seq. So Arabidopsis has about 27,000 genes. So we use this technique to evaluate the expression of each of these genes in our conditions. And we are always asking which genes respond to the elicitor in, in each treatment. So here, if you look at plants growing without any bacteria, we're gonna have a total of 492 genes differentially expressed or responding to flag 22, either more or less expressed. We have a very similar number of genes in the other control condition, which is the bacteria, the, the dead bacteria, right? However, if you look here, only seven genes responded to the treatment when the syncone was present alive. So basically, we don't really see any response to the elicitor when this microbiome is present. And this is also shown here in this Venn diagram, which is showing basically the overlap of the genes that are differentially expressed in each of these treatments. So uh, our two control conditions have a quite good overlap, which is also highlighted here. This is a Pearson correlation, pairwise correlation of all the, the uh, among the three treatments. So you can see here the two controls have a pretty high correlation, meaning that they respond to the treatment very similarly, but there is essentially no correlation uh, uh, between the, the syncone treatment with the other two controls. So as I said, the bacteria really affects how the plants respond to flag 22.
But the real question here is, is basically what changes, right? What are these changes? What exactly, which genes are, are, are responding to the treatment or not? And this is summarized in this figure here. So on the left side, we have a heat map. This heat map is showing the expression level of all 715 genes that responded to the treatment in at least one of the conditions. So each row here in this figure is one gene. And the color represents the expression level. Red means high expression and blue means low expression. And you can see this figure here as three main blocks. We have a first block here on the left side, which are plants growing without bacteria and then with and without flat nature. We have a block here in the middle, which are plants growing with the heat killed bacteria and then with and without flat nature. And then you're gonna have this last condition here, this last block, which are plants growing with the syncome, with the bacteria alive, with and without flight control. So the first thing I want you to see in this figure is that these two blocks here, they are very similar to each other, right? They are almost a mirror of each other. So this is exactly what I just told you, the control conditions, they behave the same. There's a higher correlation between these two um, uh, uh, treatments here. But now this last block here, which are plants growing with the syncone alive, it's completely different. So the bacteria affects the expression of these genes. And I want you to focus on this group of genes. This is what we call cluster one, which is also highlighted here on the right side. This is a group of 281 genes that are activated by FLAG22. How do you know that they are activated? You just see here, in the control condition without flag 22 they have low expression, so it's blue. And when you add the elicitor to the plant, when you give the elicitor to the plant, the expression of these genes is, is higher, it's red, right? It's also shown here in this box plot. You can just see that their expression is activated. Now, just look here. When the syncone is present, we don't really see this activation. They remain blue, right? So this is shown here. So this tells us that the synthetic community um, antagonizes the effect that FLAG22 has in these genes, right? It's preventing the activation of these genes. So this is cool. We were very excited when we saw these, these results because this tells us that the microbiome can interfere with the plant response to this well-known uh, um, uh, elicitor. But the next question is, what are these genes? What is that is exactly being suppressed? And this is summarized in this figure here. This figure is what we call um, an enrichment analysis. So each gene in the genome will be assigned a function, okay? Normally a biological process. And we basically ask, okay, if I take this set of gene here, uh, is it enriched in a particular function? Because you can imagine that if you pick a bunch of genes by chance, just picking a little bit of everything, you're not really enriching your sets for anything. But if there is a biological meaning behind this, you're gonna find normally a lot of biological processes related uh, in that set, right? So what I really want you to see here is that in this figure, each row represents a cluster in this figure. So we have eight clusters. In each column is a different biological process. The ones that are related to immune response are here, right? Every time we have a dot in this image, it means that we have a uh, enrichment of that particular process. What I really want you to see is that cluster one is enriched in terms related to immune response. So just summarizing here the result, the defense genes that are activated by the elicitor are in cluster one, okay? So there are other genes that are activated by the elicitor in design cluster two and four, but they are not related to the defense response. They are actually related to the development. So the defense genes are in cluster one and the cluster one is suppressed by the microbiome. So this tells us that the microbiome can modulate the plant immune response.
And this is also seen here. We are pretty much doing the same thing, but now I'm asking, okay, what kind of gene families is enriched in these gene sets? What kind of gene families found here in this cluster one? And what I'm gonna find here are essentially families that are well-known uh, components of the plant in response. For instance, you're gonna have some receptor kinases here, which are those receptors that perceive MAMPs, and you're gonna have these working conscription factors and some antimicrobial uh, uh, families here. And in particular, these transcription factors here known as WORKI are quite interesting because they are master regulators of defense response in plants, okay? So Arabidopsis has a total of 72 of these WORKI uh, genes and 10 of them were differentially expressed in our experiments. So in other words, 10 of these 72 works are somewhere in this figure here. And it turns out that seven of them are in cluster one. So if I break here the number of work is per cluster, I can tell you that cluster one to four are actually the, the work is that are normally activated by flag to the roots. And clusters five to six, they are normally suppressed. So we have eight work is that are activated and two work is that are suppressed. So among the eight workers that are activated, seven are in cluster one. So essentially this microbiome suppresses almost all workers that are normally activated by flight nature. And this is exciting because as I said, these are masters regulators of defense response in plants. So we are seeing the microbiome shutting down the immune system from the, the very top. And this is also shown here, okay? It's just showing the same, showing the same thing. So cluster one is highly enriched for workies. We have way more workies than we would expect by chance, about 10 times more than we would expect by chance. And here we have the expression profile of, of each of these genes. So blue means the expression in plants growing without bacteria. Yellow is the expression of the gene growing in plants with the dead bacteria and red with the bacteria alive. So just look at this. You're gonna have high expression of these guys in the control conditions, which is blue and yellow, but not really when the microbiome is there uh, alive, right? Which is the, the red condition. So this is just showing that this, this, these genes are being suppressed. Okay, so as a summary of this first part, um, I can tell you that part of the flag 22 regulon is not responsive in the presence of this synthetic community. And I'm talking about cluster one. I'm talking about these defense related genes. So in other words, here we establish that the plant microbiome can suppress the plant immune system. Okay. So this is essentially the experiments that I just showed you. So what we did was to grow plants with the synthetic community, which is made of 35 members, and then with and without flag control. Then the next question was, okay, how each of these 35 bacteria interact with the plant immune system? Okay, now I'm not talking about a community, but I'm talking about mono associations. I'm essentially, uh, uh, talking about repeating this experiment, but now providing each of these 35 bacteria to the plant alone. Okay, so this is essentially a repeat of the first experiment that I just showed you. And essentially the controls will be that, uh, uh, the three conditions that I just mentioned, but in addition to them, we're gonna have 35 extra conditions, which are the, uh, the mon associations. So each of the 35 members alone. And of course, with and without flag 22, with nine biological replicates. So we have about 700 samples here, and we pretty much did the same thing. We evaluated root development and gene expression using RNA-seq. And this figure summarizes the, the results related to root development. So this is a heat map that represents root length. Red means long roots. And blue means 
short routes, okay? And we have two conditions, two lanes here. One is mock, which is no flag 22, and the other is the treatment, you know, flag 22 added. So uh, this last row here is our control condition. So plants growing without any bacteria. And you can see that the roots are long without flag 22, but then when you add the elicitor, the roots become short. So it goes from red to blue. And it's actually shown here, right? It's pretty much what I showed before. So the presence of flag 22 causes this short root phenotype. And then each row in this figure is, uh, represents plants growing with each of the bacteria that we have in our uh, experiments. And we have a set of bacteria that actually have a neutral effect, meaning that they don't really affect how the plant responds to flag 22. One example is shown here. So you can add this bacteria to the plant and the flag 22 peptide will cause a short root phenotype. But it's super cool to see this. We have a group bacteria that we call suppressors. These are bacteria that, when present, they prevent the short root phenotype. So the plants remain with long, root, with long roots even when we add flag 22 to them. So you see it's red on the left side and it's also red on the right side. So they can suppress the plant response to flag 22. But we also have the opposite, right? We have what we call inducers. These are bacteria that, when present, they cause the short root phenotype, even in the absence of the flag 22 peptides. So they are already blue here in this first row. And of course, if you add flag 22, it's still blue. So this is cool because this tells that this community is very heterogeneous. Some bacteria will not affect the plant response to flag 22. Some will suppress it, and other will even mimic, will induce this short root phenotype. And one thing that I want to highlight here is that these squares here on the left side, they represent the taxonomic classification of these bacteria. And if you look here in the suppressors, for instance, it's quite colorful, right? You have red, green, purple, yellow, blue, meaning that these bacteria belong to very different taxonomic groups. So the ability of the plant to suppress the plant, oh, sorry, the ability of these bacteria to suppress the plant response to flag 22 is not restricted to a specific taxonomic group. It's actually widespread among uh, a diversity of groups. Okay, but here we are looking at root development, right? Just as a, a proxy for the plant response to flag 22. But we really want to know how is the plant immune system behaving in the presence of these bacteria. And we can do this, well, using several strategies. One of them is just comparing the plant response to each of these bacteria to the control, which is no bacteria. So essentially we ask, what genes respond to strain one in comparison to the control condition? Which genes respond to strain two in comparison to the same control. What about strain three and so on? So the number of genes that are differentially expressed in each of these 35 comparisons uh, is shown here in this figure on the right side. So uh, as you would expect, each bacteria has a specific effect in the plant transcriptome. So for instance, we're gonna have strains that actually, actually promotes the change of thousands of genes, like 4,000 genes responded to the bacteria, while others didn't really change anything or changed only a handful of genes. So this tells us that each strain affects the plant in a specific manner, right? Uh, some will cause large changes, others will cause uh, small changes. But this doesn't tell yet how the plant immune system behaves, right? So to answer this, we need to actually look at these genes to explore these a little more, go deeper into the biology. And uh, again, we can do this using several strategies. And one way to do this kind of thing in a high throughput manner is with this enrichment analysis. This is pretty much what I just showed you. I'm not getting into the details of this, but this here, each column, 
is a different treatment of the experiment. You can see this as a different bacteria, okay? And each row is a biological process. And the process here on the top, which are highlighted in yellow, are the ones related to defense genes, right? To immune response. So every time we have a circle here, it means that that process was activated. So what we see here, first of all, is that most of these strains activate the plant immune system to some level, right? Because we see these, these balls uh, uh, in most of the columns in this uh, yellow part. And this is not necessarily bad, right? We know that some good bacteria activates the plant immune system and makes the plant more capable of defending itself against pathogens. So this can be good. But this also tells us that the plant perceives this bacteria and mounts an immune response. But what's, what is pretty cool is that some strains, which are these ones here on the top, they don't really activate the plant's defense response, right? So you can see that they don't really have any activation of uh, defense-related genes. So this tells us that they are either able to suppress the immune response or they evade recognition. They are just escaping. They are just hiding uh, uh, from the plant. So this is cool, okay? This tells us that we have both activators and suppressors of defense response. Now, what I just told you was what we call a chronic exposure, a chronic response to the treatment. And why chronic? Because this was a 12-day treatment. The plants were treated with this elicitor for 12 days. But I have to tell you that plants respond to flagellin to really, really quickly, like within five minutes when, when, when they get in touch with this peptide to reflect them too, they start showing a number of biochemical response, right? And uh, this immune response had, has been studied mostly as this acute treatment within minutes or a few hours. So then we ask this, can our, our suppressors also suppress this more canonical, this acute response to flagellin too? So we did this using a completely independent uh, system. So what we are doing here is to use a transgenic line of our plant. And this transgenic line expresses these, this gene called GUS under the control of this promoter that responds to flight in the roots. Basically what happens is this. When the plants activate an immune response, the roots become blue. Okay, that's pretty much what happens in this plant. So what we do is we treat the plant with each of our bacteria and then we provoke them with the elicitor and we ask if the elicitor had an effect or not. So if the bacteria have no effect in preventing the immune response, the, the, the roots will be blue. And if they have an effect, the roots will remain white. Okay? So what we see, this is just a summary of the results, is something like this. We have a bunch of blue roots, meaning that many bacteria didn't really interfere with the plant's response to flight from the immune system. While others, which are highlighted here in, in red, kept the, 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 the roots white, meaning that they suppressed the plant's immune response. And why is this important? because this is a completely different assay. This is just a, a, a completely different experiment, a different strategy to measure suppression of the immune response. And that's even a, a, an acute response. It's not a chronic 12-day response. It's a few hours uh, of treatment, okay? So we actually did a bunch of these experiments. I'm not getting into the details of uh, each of them here, but they are summarized in this figure. So let me explain what we have here and how we interpret this figure. So here we have each row as a bacteria, okay? And these bacteria are all members of our synthetic community. And each column here is a different experiment that we did to evaluate if the bacteria can suppress the plant in the system or not. Every time we have a red box, it means that the bacteria behave as a suppressor, okay? 
every time we have a blue box, the bacteria actually induced the dependent immune response in that experiment. And a white box means that the bacteria didn't have any, any effect. So I wanted to see here, we have this group of about 10 bacteria that are very robust suppressors. They suppress most the immune response in most, if not all, experiments that we did. Okay, like this one here, it suppressed the plant response to plant 22 every single time that we measured in any different uh, assay that we did. So these are very cool uh, uh, and robust suppressors. But at the same time, we have a bunch of non suppressors here and even uh, inducers. So this tells us that this community is made of suppressors and non suppressors that are put together as uh, a synthetic microbiome. And now, now, another thing that I want to highlight here is that this column here, these squares, they represent the taxonomic distribution. And again, it's very colorful. So the ability of these bacteria to suppress the plant immune system is not restricted to a specific group of bacteria. It's actually widespread in the bacteria uh, um, uh, evolution tree. Now, very cool. We can say bacteria that live in association with plant roots can suppress the plant immune system. So what? Right? What we learn from this? What's the biological meaning of this observation? So uh, to address this, we actually made smaller communities made exclusively of suppressors and non-suppressors, right? So we took five very good suppressors, which are highlighted here with these red arrows, and we took five taxonomically matching non-suppressors. And we made two communities, right? So essentially, we started with this community of 35 members. We separated them into suppressors and non-suppressors. And then we gave these communities to the plants in two different uh, batches, right? And why did we do this? Because based on what we learned for pathogens, the ability to suppress the plant immune system is important for colonization, right? The pathogen or, or a pathogen that can suppress the immune system grows better than one that cannot. So our hypothesis here was that suppressors would be better colonizers than non-suppressors. So we basically uh, inoculated these bacteria in the plants and we counted bacterial cells in the groups. And the answer was essentially that yes, suppressors grow much better than non-suppressors. We have about 10 times more bacteria in the suppressors or in plants colonized with suppressors than in plants colonized with non-suppressors. This is a log scale, okay? So yes, this tells us that the suppressors may have some advantage in terms of colonizing plant tissues. And if we measure the, the immune response of these plants here, we're gonna see as expected, we don't really see any activation of defense response here in plants colonized with the suppressors, but then when you have the suppressors, the, oh, sorry, when you have the non-suppressors present, the immune response is, is activated. So there is a clear correlation between strong activation of defense and lower colonization of uh, the roots. Okay? Another thing that we tested was the idea that suppressors actually help non-suppressors. Because as I said, these two groups of strains are found together in the microbiome, right? Microbiome is a, a mixture of suppressors and non-suppressors. So our hypothesis was that maybe the non-suppressors are helped by the suppressors. Maybe they benefit from the presence of those suppressors partners. So we did this basically uh, inoculating plants without bacteria, with suppressors and with non-suppressors. And then we added a focal strain. We added a bacteria that we could measure the growth uh, later on, okay? Uh, actually, we did this with two different bacteria. And what you have to see here is that there is always more growth of these bacteria when the plants were pre-colonized with the suppressors, indicating that the suppressors may help non-suppressors to grow. 
And this is quite cool because this, this is important for us to understand how a community is assembled in a plant tissue, right? Maybe you have this, this mixture of suppressors and non-suppressors, and the suppressors shut down the plant defense response, and then the others just follow and colonize, just taking advantage of the first guys. Okay, and the last thing that I want to show you here is our attempts to understand how these bacteria suppress the immune response. Uh, and we are essentially talking about one specific strain that we call MF79. The, this is a species of Diella japonica. And uh, it's one of the best suppressors that we found in our experiments. So you can see here, the roots are white because this bacteria suppresses the plant immune system. And we chose this bacteria because it has in its genome genes that encode for the type 3 secretion system. And as I told you before, the type 3 secretion system is this molecular syringe that is used by pathogens to inject virulence factors inside the plant cell. So we had a very, a very simple hypothesis here, kind of boring hypothesis, to be honest. This commensal bacteria, just like pathogens, uses the type 3 secretion system to suppress the plant immune system. Okay? So we tested this by creating mutants. We created strains that lack the syringe, and we measured uh, suppression of the defense response. And then here's where things get cool, because to our surprise, these mutants still retain the ability to suppress the plant immune response. So here are plants growing without bacteria. The roots are blue, so we have an immune response, okay? Wild type bacteria roots are white. That's what we would expect. No activation of the defense response. But then these two mutants still cause this white root phenotype, right? So this tells us that the type 3 secretion system is not required for suppression of the root uh, defense response. So this was surprising because this is different for, uh, from what we, we have established for pathogens. But then the question is, okay, uh, let's follow this up and uh, let's find out how this bacteria suppresses the immune response. And how did we do this? We actually assembled a collection of uh, mutants of this strain. We tested about 4,500 mutants individually for their ability to interfere with the plant immune response. So we basically took strain by strain, mutant by mutant, and we tested, okay, there is suppression. No, there is suppression. Yes, and we did this screening uh, more than 4,000 times. And we found two mutants. We found these two mutants here that lost the ability to suppress the immune response. So again, this is what we would expect in plants growing without bacteria, so blue roots means activation of defense with the wild type strain, so there is suppression here, there's no blue. And then these two mutants here, the roots are blue, meaning that they lost the ability to suppress the plant's defense response. Now, what are these genes? It's quite cool to see that these genes encode components of the same molecular machinery. GSPD is right here, GSPE is right here. So they are components of the so-called type two secretion system. So this is quite interesting because in contrast to the type 3 secretion system, which injects the factors inside the plant cell, the type 2 secretion system secretes the substrates to the extracellular medium. So this is telling us that this strain secretes something outside the plant cell and then there is suppression of the plant defense response. And in agreement to this, just the supernatant, you know, you grow the bacteria, you remove the cells, just take the, the culture medium, that is sufficient to suppress the plant immune response. So the cells are not really required, but only what they, they produce. And of course, the supernatants of the mutants don't have this effect. And we can, we can go even further, and we can actually uh, filter 
this self free supernatant. So this is bacteria were grown in this medium, and then we just remove the cells, we take the supernatant, and we pass through this filter here, and we separate in two fractions. One fraction, which is the fruit fruit, will have small molecules, or molecules that are smaller than 10 kilodaltons, and what is in the filter, the written date, is higher than 10 kilodaltons. So if you look here, only this fraction of the written date uh, uh, retains the ability to suppress the transmitting response, meaning that the molecule is relatively large. It's probably a protein that is larger than 10 uh, kilodaltons. Unfortunately, we, we don't know yet what the protein is, but it might be, for instance, a protease, which degrades uh, the flag 22 peptides and maybe makes, makes it unavailable to, to the plant. Okay, just a summary of what I showed you. Uh, I just told you that just like pathogens, no pathogenic bacteria can suppress the plant's immune system. So it's important to know this because, as I said, we have been studying plant immunity in the context of plant pathogen interactions. But plants, plants establish these, these, communi these communities with the microbiome, with non pathogenic bacteria, but they also interfere with the plant's immune system. And specifically, this community that we assembled can suppress a sector of the flag 22 response, which are exactly the defense related genes. And more than that, the ability to suppress this response is common because we had at least 10 among 35 strains that were very, very good suppressors, and it's also tax taxonomically widespread. The importance of being taxonomically widespread is that this likely evolved multiple times independently. And if this evolved independently, it means that we likely have multiple different mechanisms of suppression, right? The type 2 secretion system that I just showed you might be one mechanism, but other strains might use different strategies that remain to be defined. And finally, both suppressors and non-suppressors co-occur in the root microbiome. And I showed you evidence that maybe the suppressors help the non-suppressors during microbiome assembly. Maybe non-suppressor bacteria can benefit from the presence of suppressor uh, partners. Okay, with this, I just wanna Give some thanks to people who have been involved in this, in this work. This is my email, my lab website. Uh, feel free to, to contact me. If you want to learn more about our, our research, uh, feel free to, to access the website. Um, with this, thank you very much for your attention. If you have any questions, please, I'll be happy to, to talk to you. Sure, okay. Hi. 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 Good, Good afternoon. afternoon. Thank you, Thank you for the, uh, the seminar. seminar. I, I, I listen, listen to myself. To myself. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, one, uh, second. one second. <laughs> okay. Uh, I don't know if I can do. Okay. 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 Uh, I have a question. It's not not necessarily about about uh, because you talked about the the the, the bacteria. The bacteria. I got it. 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 I I know it's hard. I don't know yes, if yes. Uh, uh, it's my out. No, no, I don't think so. Just a second. Just a second. <laughs> Does, Does my wife has, has returned, returned as well? well? Oh, my God. Oh my God. That's yeah, weird. weird. Come here. Come here. Because you don't know. Okay, okay. okay. Just a second. <laughs> Paul, Paul. I, I yes. I, 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 I,
Does it work? Yeah. Yeah. No, no. no. I can no. no. <laughs> You can just hit this. Um, um. 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 And now, and now. No, no. Uh, just a second. Is it better? Is it better? Is it? Yes. 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 Can you listen to us? Yes. Yes, it's perfect for me. Okay. Okay. So, so uh, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> with their wish. Okay. 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 Uh, okay, okay, I want to, I want to, I want to I hear, want to hear uh, a little bit about, about, about I'm, I'm sorry, I'm sorry for, for this, this mess. Mess. but I want to hear a little bit about you, a little bit, little bit from you about the, the like the touch, touch, touch things. Things. And, and then the importance. Uh, I don't know. I, I don't know. I, I know that I you're know talking, that talking about like micro and like bacteria, guy, but. I've heard, I've heard you were doing my, my, my classes, my classes on, on, on physiology, physiology about, about touch genes, genes and, and, and how, how and, and it's and important for uh, uh, I don't know if it's your, 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 your view exactly, exactly, exactly but, but, I, but I think it's very, very interesting, interesting and it's a little bit related to what you were talking about. So if you can. Herbivore is not my field. Uh, although there's a lot of you know similarities between the plant response to, to microbes and herbivores, uh, but I don't really know about touch genes. Can you maybe expand a little more on this? What do you know about them? Uh, uh, okay, okay. Uh, it's, uh, it's... <laughs> okay, yeah, 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 it's back, back. back. But, but uh, uh, it's, it's they they are changed, they are activated. When, when oh my god so when 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 like uh, uh, insects, insects uh, uh, touch touch the, 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 the leaves, leaves like, like the leaves, mm -hmm. the leaves mm -hmm. the some some are activated, are activated just by just touching, touching, touching and then okay. uh, the, the plant, plant, plant starts to start with some proteins and, and, and other things, things to protect then cell 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 delivery. So I don't know if it's like very new or not. I heard about it. Some 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 I don't know when. Like during my undergrad. And I don't know. I I'm interested. Yeah, unfortunately, I don't know much about these genes. I can tell you, it's probably something new. Uh, but I can talk a little bit about the response to herbivores and uh, other things that might be of interest. Uh, basically, the plants have an immune system that perceives a bunch of different stimuli, right? It can be microbial molecules, but it can be even their own molecules, right? For microbes, we call these molecules MEMPs, which are the micro associated molecular patterns. But sometimes, you know, if an insect kills the plant and eats the leaf, it's going to cause damage. And you're going to have a bunch of plant molecules swimming around and they shouldn't be there. It can be, for instance, the plant cell wall. So we call these molecules sometimes DEMPs for damage associated molecular patterns. And this will indicate the presence of a, a herbivore. Uh, uh, herbivores, uh, for instance. And this will be perceived by a receptor as well, and will activate a bunch of biochemical response, including, for instance, protease inhibitor. So the insects go there and eat the protease inhibitor, and this will give just a, a bad stomach ache for the insect. Okay? Um, but there are sensors for, for touching. I remember a few years ago, a work in which uh, uh, it was a quite curious, uh, a quite curious experiment. Uh, it was basically uh, uh, comprised of touching the plants every day. They had two plants or two groups of plants. One plant was there just sitting alone and no touching, and the other was like 
10 touches every day in the morning and 10 touches every day in the afternoon. And it turns out that in the end of, I don't remember how many days, the ones that were touched every day, they, was, they were much smaller, right? And then they, they investigated the, the, the genetic response and found the activation of some stress-related uh, components. But I haven't seen much about you know, this response to touch since then. Okay, okay thank, you. thank you. Sorry, I can't say much more about this. No, 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 no I'm sorry, I'm for, sorry for, for the mess here. here. It's just, just like, too, like, too confused, confused to think and hear so. yourself. <laughs> no problem. Uh, no, just, uh, no, just something, something, something that, that, I, that I heard also, heard also from touch from the classes, the classes. Um, uh, um, is that, is also, that also they are activated, activated also in all states of the states delivery, delivery uh, when uh, uh, sex, for example, for example some, parts, some, parts, some parts, especially, especially from like the big parts, big parts of the plan. Of the plan. But also, mm -hmm. also what I found interesting is that climbing plants, for example, that grow on other plants, they like, like these touches are very important for them to, like know, like know which which route they should they take, should take and which, there you go. Um, so so especially, especially like, like in the tip of, tip the, of the, plant, the plant for example, for example they, grow. they grow or also, or also mm -hmm. they can also, can also um, activate, activate the kind of gene and, that um, have, have consequences, consequences in their growth, in their growth. Um, um, so yeah just, so yeah, just something that, that I uh, um, remember that I found, that I found interesting it totally makes sense. And uh, another thing that we can add is that some plants can parasite other plants, right? So there is a, a whole field studying this plant-plant interaction and how one plant can defend against other plants. Hi, Paul. Hi, Paul. Uh, can you hear me? Can you hear me? All right. All right. Yes. Okay. Hello. Yes. here, but you know, I, I, I give a, 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 grad student, a, a class to grad students of that during a, a whole semester about, you know, the planning season. season. So I, I get very excited to talk about this. Uh, what I can tell you is that, yes, plants have an immune system and it's innate, okay? It's not adaptive as animals have, although we can talk uh, about this real quick. Maybe I will just share my screen again and I can show you an image that will make things easier to follow. I think this one. Do you see? Resume. It's actually. I will stop sharing to share again. This one. Do you see this image, Steven? You see, right? Okay. The first thing I want to tell you is essentially what I mentioned uh, in my introduction, is that plants have immune receptors to perceive, you know, microbial molecules. That's the basis of the plant immune system. But this is just the beginning, right? It's just the sensor of the, the uh, uh, the damage or the, the risk the invader there. Once one of these molecules is activated, and this is like just highlighted here, there's this microbial molecules as a star that is being perceived by this receptor. 
we're going to have some uh, um, intracellular signaling, and this will activate things like MAT kinases, which are just proteins that phosphorylate each other, and then you end up activating a specific transcription factor. For instance, the work in transcription factors that will activate defense-related genes. What are defense-related genes? They can be enzymes that kill the pathogen. For instance, chitinase that cleave chitin. So this will digest the cell wall of you know, fungi, for instance. They can be protease or protease inhibitors. They can be secondary metabolites, as you mentioned. So a bunch of toxins that plants can produce that will kill the, the pathogen. And there are other things. Like, we're going to have the influx of calcium. So it's a very quick response, and calcium will activate other uh, calcium-dependent kinase, uh, dependent kinase that will also regulate the expression of genes. But also, we're going to have the production of reacting oxygen species. They will produce, they will produce you know, uh, hydrogen peroxide, for instance, or oxygen uh, superoxide, things that are highly reactive and will just kill the pathogen that is here uh, outside the cell, for instance. Um, another thing is the reinforcements of the cell wall. They will start producing a bunch of sugars and polymers that will make the cell wall thicker to make it harder for the microbe to digest it and you know, just penetrate uh, the plant species. Now, this is mostly what we know as MTI or man triggered immunity. It's like the first half of the immune response. Sometimes we have these receptor series, the NOR receptors, that will perceive the presence of an effector, and this will usually trigger cell death. The plant will kill itself. The, the infected tissue will just collapse to prevent the spread of the pathogen. And you know, we are living the most exciting time of all plant immunology because we are just finding out how these receptors work. We have discovered them in 1994, so almost 30 years ago. And just, you know, a couple of years ago, we started to understand how they actually function, how they signal an immune response and how they kill uh, a plant cell. And I can maybe show you like this figure here. They are normally something like this. this is, imagine this is one of these receptors that when it's activated, in this case, it forms this pentamer here, just like five units get together. And it will form this very beautiful structure here that is like this. And it's gonna penetrate the membrane and form a calcium uh, um, channel. So you know we're gonna have calcium getting into the cell and this will somehow that we don't know trigger the plant cell death. So it's very cool to see how these, these receptors work. And we just found out how they work because we were able to define their uh, you know, three-dimensional structure using you know, new technologies like cryo electron microscopy, things like this. So that's pretty much it. it. The, the, the cell kill itself in this case, or they will produce a number of uh, defense-related proteins and metabolites. Now, yeah, you mentioned about, about adaptation. Uh, there is no adaptation, but there is a very recent, let's say, concept, which is the plant microbiome extends the plant immune response or the plant immune system. They form a first layer of defense against pathogens. And uh, plants can reshape their microbiome. When they get stressed, they can just produce molecules that attract some molecules or, or some microbes and then these new microbes can help the plant to survive and they will stay, stay in the soil as a legacy for future generations. So it's not really what we would call an adaptive immune system as we call in, in, in mammals, but it's somehow an adaptation of at least the microbiome level of defense, this recruitment of uh, uh, microbes. Did I answer your question? Oh, oh thank you, Paulo. It, it clarified uh, a lot. Cool. Uh, 
Hi, Paulo. Uh, I have a, a, a follow-up question. You just mentioned how the, the microbiome can help the plant to protect itself against uh, pathogens, against other bad mi uh, microbiota. But on the other hand, you showed that non-pathogenic uh, microbes, they can uh, inhibit the, the plant human response and that, that helps other bacteria to grow. So maybe yeah. th these uh, non-pathogenic uh, microbes, they might perhaps help uh, pat pathogenic microbes by doing that? Oh man, I have to share something with you. That's such a good point. I will share a figure that I just made for a paper that we submitted last week. And it's a, it's a current opinion paper. You know, we are just discussing some it's a review paper, some ideas, and we end with this figure here discussing exactly what it, what it just mentioned. Can the microbiome actually help pathogens instead of just in protecting plants? I'm going to share these slides here. Oh, where's my share screen? Let me know if you are seeing the image, please. Can you see it? We can. Okay, so look at this. Um, the microbiome suppresses plant immunity, right? We just established this. The question is, can the microbiome help pathogens? Like, can some pathogens benefit from this suppression? and maybe um, uh, cause disease, we don't know yet, okay? This has not been shown so far, but it, it is a possibility, but it's one of the questions that we highlight here as you know, important for future discussion. Uh, now, I think you guys had some, some classes with Kara Haney last week, right? And her lab has shown this, this phenomenon of ISS, induced systemic susceptibility. That's pretty much some microbiome members in the roots that promote susceptibility to pathogens in the shoots, right? So we have examples of things similar to this happening, right? It's not as necessarily a suppression of the plant immune system, not in this sense that I showed you, but some hormonal changes in the plant and make it susceptible to pathogens in a, a, a distant part. So yes, uh, what you asked might be a possibility, but remains to be proved. Uh, thank you. Ooh. One more, I guess. It's just a really quick question. Um, so far, we already know that the microbe modulates the immune response of the plant and we already see like which gene is responds to that plant immunity but from my point of view we still have like this big gap of uh, what is the functional response under these genes are expressed more precisely i don't know if you have considered like integrate other omic data like metabolites to see what are uh, under which a stimuli does these genes mm -hmm. respond precisely. And talking about the inducer uh, versus suppressors, I truly believe that part of the difference of uh, induced immune response or suppressed immune response can be related to the metabolites that these bacteria secrete to the medium. But I don't know if you can talk more about it. Yeah, these are, these are very interesting points. Um, one thing that we suspect is important to be suppressed is the biosynthesis of a group of secondary metabolites known as glucosinolates, okay? Why am I telling this? When the roots are exposed to FLAC22, they activate a bunch of defense-related genes, right? And among these genes, we have the entire biosynthesis route of these glucosinolate uh, uh, toxins, let's call them toxins, right? Antimicrobial uh, molecules. Uh, now, maybe these bacteria wants to suppress 
the synthesis of these molecules, right? And then the absence of them would make them more, uh, uh, more efficient to colonize uh, the plant tissues. We are actually testing this at the moment, okay? We are doing experiments to understand what exactly needs to be suppressed among these, you know, bunch of genes that are uh, uh, suppressed. What, in terms of, you know, metabolite uh, uh, that would actually kill the bacteria, so the bacteria wants it down. Um, now, the difference between suppressor and non-suppressor, I totally agree with you. It might be that some bacteria produce specifically uh, metabolites that turn the immune system down, but it might be also proteins, right? As I mentioned, maybe it's a protease, and this protease would uh, degrade the man, would degrade the flag 22 peptide, so the plant will never see it. Uh, it might be both, you know, it, it, it can be both. And the nice thing is that this is all new, so we have our work here, another work from the Max Planck Institute and one work from the University of uh, Utrecht in Netherlands that showed this suppression of the plant immune response by the microbiome. And uh, nobody really defined uh, a general mechanism so far. Of course, only three works, how can we make any generalization? Uh, so there's room for a lot of research here and, you know, people need to define how the microbiome suppresses the plant immune response. I'm sure we're gonna find a lot of uh, mechanisms, including a diversity of metabolites and, and proteins as well. Thanks for the question. Thank you. Any last question? There's one last question. Cool. Uh, hi. Uh, in one of the, the, the pictures that you showed us, there was the, the plant immune system. And then two things mm -hmm. that really uh, catch my attention were that you have the MAP kinase cascade, and mm -hmm. uh, the receptors are based on leucine-rich uh, residuals. And these both Reduce. strategies are very related to the, to the in innate yeah. immune system of animals in general. Mm -hmm. So my first question is, uh, how you think they are both related, like the the evolutionary path from this? Because, yeah, it's just a, a, an evolutionary convergence, or you think that have an ancient, uh, 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 you know, origin that <laughs> then mm -hmm. was splitted? And the other question is, how diverse is this uh, uh, receptors of the plants? Because it did not look like a very big chain to you have, you know, a lot of possible combinations. And then how this, this homeostasis and all of those uh, uh, microbiome can be set and specific mm -hmm. just based on in this, this family of receptors. Wow, so many great uh, comments. Uh, let's see, how can I start? Uh, we can start expanding uh, what you just noticed. Uh, in addition to this, leucine rich repeat uh, receptors and MAP kinase, we have other uh, components that are shared between animals and plants. And one of them is the NOR family of receptors. You know, NOR in, in animals can recognize MAMPs, and uh, we have here NORs that recognize the, the effectors. It seems to be all uh, convergent evolution. It seems that these particular domains, like the leucine rich repeat domain, has been um, uh, recruited several times as a platform to you know, detect um, uh, especially proteins and other, other molecules. The number of receptors that a plant has is quite variable. It can be normally from 700 uh, receptor like kinases in Arabidopsis to more than a thousands in rice, for instance. Uh, the number of, and these are the cell membrane receptors. The intracellular receptors can range from a few hundreds, maybe 150 in our abdopsis to maybe 600, 700 in, in rice. Uh, but this is somehow a limited number of receptors, right? If you think that plants, they don't have an adaptive immune system, they have this fixed number of, let's say just 150 receptors, in principle, you would say, okay, 
this plant is limited to perceiving 150 molecules. But it's not true because plants use an indirect model of recognition. They, uh, it's what we call the guard model. These receptors, they guard plant proteins, plant components, plant structures. And when the pathogen manipulates these proteins or these guarded components, the immune system is activated. It's like a red trap, right? You have the trap and you have the cheese. So any mouse that touches the cheese will activate the immune response or the trap. So that's pretty much what plants do. So with a very limited number of receptors, they can perceive a wide number of uh, pathogens and uh, different pathogens that normally do the same thing, right? They will attack specific components of the plant immune system. They will attack a kinase because that kinase is super important. So the plant protects that kinase with a receptor. So that's one thing that happens. Okay, thanks. Oh, cool, thank you. Um, I think we don't have time for um, more questions now. Um, I want to thank you uh, so much, Paulo, for all your contribution uh, in the vaccines and now uh, with your seminar. Um, Ricardo is not here anymore, as I told you, but I'm sure he's very happy with your participation. And uh, let's thank him again. <laughs> thank you very much, guys. Uh, as I said, I'm very happy to, to participate. Thank you so much for the questions. It's really exciting to. You know, I, I've heard that these students are good, but now I can see that they are really, really good. Oh, indeed. they are my kids. I'm not their mom, but they are my kids. Obrigada, Paulo. Tchau, tchau, gente. Muito obrigado. Thank you. <laughs>